Hey guys, we're here for episode 12 of the e-commerce opportunity and I'm joined by Taylor today. Taylor, how are you? What's up, dude? I'm doing well. It's good to be here. Good to see you. Like the uh, the the neon sign up above the head. You got the backdrop popping. Got the family. You're dialed, man. I like it. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. We were actually just chatting before this. Um, I think the last time that we connected, I guess at least in person or kind of for for a while, was about two years ago. I was in your office and you gave me some killer advice about like how to remove myself from the day to day and not just be buried in the grind. So I appreciate you for that feedback, and I'm really excited yeah, to. Look at you now. I'll take all that credit. No, just kidding. But uh, yeah, you saw by that feels like dude, doesn't that feel like a thousand lifetimes ago? We were still in person at an office, um, and I think you, you and your partner were sort of taking that next step of making a bunch of hires, and you were sort of still doing doing it all. And it was like, hey, man, you you can you can level it up a degree, and you you've kicked ass, man. So congrats on everything. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate that. And no, I'm I'm excited about all the success you guys are having. And I've got a lot of really cool questions that I came up with, and even better questions from Twitter. So. Let's, let's dive in. Do you kind of mind starting by sharing like what you're currently working on? Yeah. So um, our universe is sort of uh, from the top down. We have a holding company called Dream Labs. And inside of Dream Labs, we have a variety of different entities. Uh, one is Common Thread Collective. That's our agency. That's my day-to-day role as the managing partner of Common Thread Collective. Um, and then we have 4x400, where we own and operate five of our own e-commerce businesses um, inside of there. That's run by Andrew Ferris. Uh, and then we have a few other uh, additional investments. Tell Me Your Dreams is a cultural development agency. We have Kinship, which is an uh, influencer marketing agency. Uh, we have a company called AMP that works for the amplification of black businesses, which is a rad community. Uh, we have investments in the Fascination and a couple of Shopify apps and different things. So um, all around the mission of helping entrepreneurs achieve their dreams in the sort of the consumer product e-commerce world. I love that, man. So what were you doing before all this? Like, was there anything that you did that set you up to do what you're doing now? Yeah, just make a thousand mistakes and then eventually <laughs> you'll get one right. Like that's that's the game. No, my life is sort of like a very nonlinear path to this point. I, I was a baseball player. So I grew up, I was a professional baseball player, played in the Yankees organization. Um, when I got released, uh, I was prepping to go to law school. That's what I thought I wanted to do. I was a political science major with a minor in psychology. And I had a friend who's now my business partner, Josh, um, who was starting a company called Power Balance, selling these silicone wristbands back in the day. And he said, hey, why don't you come over between class and you can print the orders off the website and take them to the post office. And so I would do that. And one day it was three orders and we'd mostly mess around. The next day it was four. And then that company just exploded. It went from zero to 60 million in revenue in 22 months, just like the most wild growth story. And it, it sort of triggered in me all the same things that sports did working with a group of friends towards a common goal. We were all young and single and we just lived in it all day, every day. And it was just so fun. Um, So as that was happening, it sort of became this thing of like, this is a real business now, what's your job gonna be? And they're like, well, you're the young person. So why don't you figure out e-commerce, social media, and you know some famous people, so you can handle influencer marketing. So that's like me Googling, how do you set up a Facebook page? What is Magento? I had no idea what I was doing, right? But what I became obsessed with was I didn't want people to think I was there because I was Josh's friend. Like I had a, I wanted, I wanted to be a master of my domain. And so I just went on the internet and read and learned everything I could. And because there was nobody else around, I got to be the expert in this area. And then it just so happened that like those skills mattered in the world. And so in that sense, I got really lucky. Um, I got, I had just incredibly blessed that they put trust in me to give me that opportunity to learn. Um, and then I, that I was in an environment where I got to do so much cool stuff, man, early on. And, uh, that was sort of the initial impetus into entrepreneurship and business building and e-com and all of that. So that was over 10 years ago now, but uh, really lucked into it in that sense. I love that, man. So I have to ask you, what what is your secret to building so many successful things? Is it people, processes, capital, something else? Like what's been your, your secret? What's been at the core of all this? I think the primary thing is people. I, I think one of the things people will look at our ecosystem and think, that I've done a lot in the reality, it's just not true. Like every one of the entities that we have, have an independent leader other than me that's driving it. And um, this is sort of goes back to the conversation that we had when we came into the office is like, people are amplifiers. Like your what you can do as a collective group of people just so far exceeds what you can do yourself. And um, for a long time, I think a lot of early entrepreneurs, like the motivation is like, you're the best at doing the thing whether that's email or Facebook ads or whatever it might be. And so the logic is like, well, I need to keep doing that thing. And I need to do that because the level at which I'm going to do it is going to be the highest. And that's true. It's, it's probably a fact, but the reality is, is that the Delta between you and other people on some tasks is actually not that large. And so what you want to do is you want to remove yourself from the places where 
you to those other people is small and put yourself into places where you to those other people is large. And, and then in some cases, there are people that are just better than you at things. And so you should find them and let them do those things. And so over the course of, you know, doing this for, I think we're seven years into building this whole thing. Like I've been obsessed with finding amazing people because they're such amplifiers and I've gotten lucky to be surrounded by rad humans. And that's, that's been the key. That's awesome. So let's talk about people. Let's talk about hiring. What is like the holding co? What's the ecosystem? Like how many people are there? And then is yeah. the biggest entity common thread? Yeah. So CTC is about 125 ish people now. Um, four by 400 probably has 25 ish. Uh, and then the others are all sub 10. Um, so across all of them, somewhere around 170 ish people or so. And, you know, it's funny hiring, hiring is an interesting thing. Um, I had to go through a really personal journey where for a long time, it was hard for me to imagine that really talented people would want to work for me. Like early on, our company was really young. And, and part of that was, I believed that the people younger than me, I, I had something to offer them. I could lead them. And then, so that was like this mental hurdle that I had to overcome. And when I realized that like to lead people, you don't have to be better than them. You don't have to have more experience than them. That's not actually the prerequisite to leadership. Um, and I had to get over this insecurity that really smart people would want to work on my thing. Like candidly, I was like, man, there's so many cool companies. Why would they want to work for me? Like, and getting over that and being willing to put yourself out there and ask and require and offer your vision to people in ways that they might reject is like an initial hurdle to get over. But once I got past that, it was a real victory to realize like, no, 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 what we're doing is meaningful. And there are people that would want to be a part of it. And it just gave me, it emboldened me to ask, to like see people go like, you're, you're amazing at your thing. Do you want to be a part of my thing? Like, um, and that was a, that was a big issue to get over in terms of hiring. Yeah, I completely resonate relate. So in terms of actually like sourcing the talent, do most people come in through a job board and most people come in through like an internal recruiter you have, do most people come in through your Twitter or someone else's Twitter. Like how do most people actually find out about you guys and want to work with you guys? Yeah. So, I mean, you guys know this, you're in a similar industry, right? Like there's a real supply and demand problem in our industry, right? In that the supply of really talented, experienced people is small and the demand for them is way, really, really, really high. So as, as employers, the market's really out of whack. So there's two things that we've done to solve for that. One is network, like you said, Twitter and the communities and being public and available and getting to know people and just personally going after relationships. Um, the second though, is that we've worked really hard to build a training and development system that allows us to take smart, hungry, interested people and train them into really talented people to sort of arbitrage the, the market in that way. So we have a community group called admission and admission serves sort of both early stage businesses and media buyers and also, uh, media buyers looking to learn more themselves. And so that, and then every quarter, what we do is we open up what we call the admission scholarship program, where we uh, invite people who are looking to learn media buying as a skill. And we'll get a thousand people a quarter that want to come in from all over the world to learn media buying. And so that becomes sourcing for young, hungry, talented people or people switching jobs, not necessarily young or, you know, uh, has really helped with a lot of our diversity initiatives and things to give us a pool of talent that we're building a relationship with. The reality is you have to cultivate talent the same way you do clients. Like it's the same sort of marketing and recruiting problem. It is on the sales side as it is with talent. So you got to treat them, treat them the same. And most of the people you're looking for are not on, they, they have jobs right now. They're in high demand. Yeah. They have jobs or they have, have agencies, right? Which makes That's sense. It, right. Like, I mean, and that, that goes back to like the number of times I've tried to get you to come work for us. I mean, even your yeah. partner, Nick, you did work for like these, there's so much opportunity, right. For people with this skills, like, the, the, their earning potential and the capacity for people in this space is massive. And so we, you know, we have a lot of turnover of people getting poached to go do rad things and we celebrate that. And we realize that that's like an unavoidable part of the present ecosystem. And so rather than being resentful or disappointed by it, we want to build a system that can exist within that, even though that's true. And so sourcing and developing people has been a huge effort of ours because man, it, it's hard. We're in the human service business. People are our product. And so we're only going to be as good as the people. And so it takes a lot of work to, to hire, retain, develop, and continue to build a system to do that. Dude, yeah, that's, that's awesome. That all really resonates and makes sense. So thank you for sharing. Um, yeah. In terms of you, like what is your day-to-day -day or week-to-week -week look like? I know you mentioned managing partner of kind of the holding co or the, the, the top co. Um, yeah. You have like CEOs on each business and you kind of report and lead and manage them. Like what, what is your day-to-day -day or week-to-week -week look like? Yeah, so so I I am not a functional manager of the other CEOs. Um, we sort of I would, what I would have is 
like sort of a peer support relationship where we're on Marco Polo, which is an app I love to use with my leaders. Like, and we're supporting, we have board level interactions at four by 400 and some of the other entities quarterly and that sort of thing. But my day to day right now is really focused on CDC. Like that's, that's my primary responsibility to the partnership is to lead that organization. And so I have this exercise that I go through every quarter where, um, I really try, sort of have this saying, which is that uh, inner peace is when your calendar aligns with your values. Um, and so what I want to do is ensure that my behavior is consistent with the things that I value and just am attempting to create the most. So what I'll do is I'll wipe my calendar clean and I build from sort of first principles. So for me, what that entails is it starts with me. And what I mean by that is like my self-care. That includes my health and fitness, rest, all those things. They go on the calendar first because if I'm not prepared, I'm useless to everybody. Then everything sort of falls apart. Then the next thing for me is my family. I have three little kids, a wife, uh, who are the most important things to me. So they go on my calendar next. Like I have baseball practice on Wednesday nights. Uh, my wife's a teacher. I have certain support blocks where I'm responsible for the kids, where she is. And like, those are on my calendar um, next. And then the next thing for me is my leaders at CTC. So the, I lead the organization through them. So time with them becomes the next step. Then all company meetings, then key sales and clients. Like, so you just sort of begin to construct your time to ensure that the things that get left out are not the most important things. Cause you, you, you get the, like the tyranny of the urgent, like every day I could fill it with a thousand tasks related to nothing. Right. And so really ensuring that I'm building up to ensure that my time is not being taken from me, but that it's being used intentionally. is something I've had to learn to think a lot more about. I, I often will say that like one of the things that's part about being a leader is like grieve frivolousness, meaning like, to just wake up and do whatever I want. And like, that's fine. Or to say whatever I want without consequences, to ship an email and not have to worry about it. But there's a burden to leading a bunch of people that requires that you actually be more thoughtful than that. And it's hard, man. I, I, I'm not naturally that way. I'm not naturally a super disciplined person, but it's something I've had to try to get better at. And I still struggle a ton, but I, I, that's sort of my method for it. Amazing. Thank you for that. I want to shift gears now to talking about like clients and not asking for your name clients, but how do you guys like acquire clients and how you guys retain clients? And obviously with the scale that you're at, a lot more people know about you, right? I'm sure a lot more comes inbound, but a lot yeah. of people listening are probably about to start an agency, early agencies doing some freelance. Like what are some ways in which you acquire clients in the past that have been successful or ways in which you can recommend someone listening, go acquire clients? Yeah. Every agency, um, that I interact with, like, this is the core question, right? And even for us early on, and the thing I, I think that is constantly happening, it's cliche, but like that businesses are under investing in their own marketing and storytelling, right? Like we, our highest paid employees are in marketing. Like we work really hard on the CTC brand and we do it because um, one, it's a catalyst for obviously the new business and recruiting, which are the two more primary things that we're after. Um, I also think that the audience development and stuff that you're doing from a reputation and value standpoint, um, is critical to success. It also forces you to crystallize your information such that you can distribute it internally and build consensus around ideas. Like there's just so much value to it. So all, everything we do is outbound or is inbound content marketing. So we don't do any cold calling or outbound sales in that way. Um, our entire system is a content system, um, that drives inbound sales that we then have a sales team that handles from there. Um, we do some of our own advertising. Um, we sort of eat our own dog food in that sense. Um, but primarily it's an investment in content and storytelling of things built from within the system, um, that are used to drive awareness for what we're up to. Awesome. And yeah, I've seen some of your other stuff. You guys clearly do a great job. So appreciate yeah. that. Um, in terms of tools, like you have 120 something people in the agency, 170 people in the ecosystem. What are some tools that you guys are using across one of the businesses, all the businesses that really help with workflow, organization, whatever it might be? Yeah. So our sort of tech stack as an agency is Slack for primary communication. We use a internal um, HR, HR software called Bob that we do all of our sort of, we call them forward progress, but these are one-on-one -on -one management things. Um, ADP is our payroll software. We use um, Asana for all project management. We use our own internal data tool that we built called Statlist for all reporting nice. and client management. Um, so that's one thing we've spent a good amount of time in building ourselves and then G drive for all file management. So, so nothing super novel there. Um, it's actually one of the things I'm thinking a lot about is especially since we've gone remote in the last year, like information systems have gotten more complex. There's less natural absorption of information. Um, and so I'm really thinking through what is the best way to deliver information broadly. Cause I think the fundamental value proposition of an agency is to operationalize institutional knowledge. It's that 
every single person has access to the knowledge of the agency. If what you're hiring is just an individual person and their individual skills, you might as well hire a freelancer, right? So if we're going to live into the core value proposition that we're offering to our clients, we've got to figure out how to get knowledge shared throughout the system. And it's really hard when it's not naturally happening conversationally or being overheard. You have to be really intentional. So we also, we also have a, a, a central learning LMS uh, that we call Common Knowledge that our head of training and development built where we all meeting notes, things like that, all information, our employee handbook all live and it's like searchable. It's just like a giant wiki basically. Um, so we try and build up that. So, but man, it's something I'm thinking a lot about. If there's anybody out there that's got great remote work systems and information systems, I'm all for learning more about it. Yeah, if you hit Taylor, hit me up as well. I'm interested too. Yeah, so I think that's a, I think it's a new world problem, right? Like, are you guys fully remote now? Yeah, we are. I think we've got like 50 to 60 people across, I don't know, like six countries. So yeah. time zones, this, that, people coming in junior, senior, this, that, and the other. It's tough. It's super tough. And what I've found is that so as a leader, there's already this problem that you have to say things way more times than you realize before people absorb it. So like I get tired of hearing myself say things way before people even understand it. Like that's, and that's a really hard thing to remember and realize that you have to constantly reinforce ideas. And now I've just found it's like even worse because there's sort of this game of telephone that happens now where it's like you're in a meeting and then that gets slacked and then that gets sent. And by the time it reaches the final person, it's like a fraction of what you intended it to be or it's been modified a bunch right and so we're playing this like never-ending game of telephone in some ways and so you have to work even harder to both share information but also check for understanding that's another big thing is like let's say you send a loom out to everybody it's not enough like so a lot of times people will be like oh leave a check mark when you've watched it or loom gives you the analytics but that to me isn't even enough you actually have to then follow up with a question that allows you to check for understanding to confirm that they understand it in the way that you're intended and those little extra bits of effort, um, they're hard, they're not natural. And so I think that there's so many ways that remote work has brought new challenges, but and new benefits too, but challenges for sure. Yeah, dude, couldn't, couldn't agree more. I have one more question for you and then I wanna open it up to kind of some of the questions from Twitter. Um, the last question I have for you is, what do you think the most valuable skill is that you've learned and kind of how does that serve you? It's mm. a great question, man. Um, so I think the valuable skill, the most valuable skill that I've learned as a leader is that I'm, um, is what I call the skill of becoming. Okay. So in the beginning, uh, I had a narrative about who I was. Um, I don't like process. I want to do the work. I don't like being on sales calls. I don't like client relationships. And I would speak all these things over myself. And then at certain points I realized like, well, Taylor, then you're either going to need to step down as the CEO or you're going to have to change that about you because the, the organization needs you to be great at process right now because we're a bunch of people. And so what I realized was like those stories, those narratives, what they were was me avoiding putting myself in places where I felt bad at something and I was insecure. And so what I did was process. I don't, I don't like it. Instead, what it was was I wasn't good at it and I was uncomfortable acknowledging that and putting myself in a place where I might look stupid because I have an ego that I had to work through and I'm working through about looking stupid. Like, I don't want that. Right. Um, so, but learning that like one, I can become good at process. I may not, we have this saying that's like, anytime someone says I'm not good at something, we say yet. Right. Like it's like this joke. It's like not yet. Right. And so it's just this reinforcement that we are all becoming and can become more. And as a leader who you are, that's gotten you to this point is who, not who you need to be to get you to the next level. And so you better always be becoming and never be finished. And I think embracing that has been um, a really useful reframe to allow me to be not good at something, to allow me to engage my weakness, um, to be more helpful. Dude, killer. That was, that was fantastic. Thank you. All right. So now the fun part, the questions from Twitter, and thank you guys for, that are listening that submitted these. Um, the first question is, how do you see Facebook ads and email best working together in the new post iOS update world? Yeah. The post iOS update world. What is the post iOS update world? I think we're still discovering what that means. Um, so I, I think there's a, there's a sort of a, an answer here that I think is more principled than tactical in the sense of like what is really happening right now. And that's that, that they need to be in relationship with one another. Um, one of the things that we work really hard on is this idea of breaking, especially for brands as they're reaching a certain growth threshold, to break down the idea of a single customer profile into cohort specific ideation, right? So. I'll give you an example. Like there, the other day I bought a sweater from Everlane. Okay. Um, giant e-com company, one of the darlings of e-com and I've received nothing but women's apparel follow-up emails. Right. And this is like, um, a fairly simple discretionary flow for somebody who appreciates email. You, you, you would certainly have something to say about that. Like 
And what it means is that the likelihood that I re-engage or open or feel like the brand is positioned for me just decreases, right? And so my LTV decreases and off we go. And it's not a, not a complex change to make, make that system, but it's to understand, okay, on the basis of certain customer types, how did they come in the door? And therefore, what should we say next, right? It's a lot more human than we make it, which is just simply this question. You're having a conversation with somebody, you're having a relationship, what should you say next? Um, and I think we would do better to ask that question about certain customer types more often. Um, and I get it, a lot of times this is a resource constraint, creating lots of specific flows is really challenging, but you can sort of work from a Pareto's principle, find the 80% purchases and speak to them really well, and then move down the chain and work to the next ones. And so um, I think the key is to begin to develop a relationship between the, the, one of the things I say is that the promise that you make in the advertising is matched on the website, is matched in the email, is matched in the experience of the product and tying it together all the way through. Um, and so every campaign that you launch, the funnel that you're launching on the front end, you should be asking the question of what's the back end. And if, if we just tied those up to start, I think we would do a lot better. Yeah, completely agree. That's awesome. Thank you. This, this next question, two different people ask more or less the same question with a different variable. So I'll let you answer it in either which direction. Um, if you were to start an e-com brand was one of the questions, or if you were to start an agency, which was the other question, what would your first steps be? So if you want to go the e-com brand route or the agency route, you know, what would your steps be to kind of set up the business for success? Yeah, so so um, one of, I think there's a question in here which is really interesting, which is which one would I start? Um, and there's this like the classic thing, which is every agency owner wants to start a, an e-com brand. Um, I think agencies are massively underrated as businesses, massively underrated. Um, and e-commerce businesses are massively overrated. Um, in terms of complexity, an e-commerce business is 10 times harder than an agency. Like by at least the cash flow, the capitalization, the inventory risk, like all of it is way, way harder um, and riskier. Maybe it has higher upside, but it certainly has higher downside. Um, so starting an agency is simple because the way that you begin is you begin with revenue. You get someone to pay you for a service. Generally speaking, what happens is you're a freelancer. You find someone who will pay you $1,000. Then you find another person who will pay you $2,000. You're making $3,000. You're sort of still at your current job. Then when you get enough to substitute your revenue, you make the switch and then you just sort of grow and you're never net negative, right? Like you can, it's very easy to be, cash flow positive, making profit, building an agency from the beginning. So the question is like, what's your skill? What's the demand for it that you can do? And then find someone to pay you for it, right? Like that's, that's how you start. And it's very simple on the agency side. On the product side, it's much more complex because one, you have to prototype a product. You have to conceptualize a thing. You have to find somebody to manufacture it. You have to find the money to buy the initial inventory because no manufacturer is giving you terms on supplier because you're just somebody with no backing or no inventory, like no uh, credit worthiness or anything else. So there's a lot of complexity there. Um, now Kickstarter and things like that certainly provide vehicles. And I think if I was like truly starting from ground zero, I would really consider one of those because they're really low risk um, in terms of your ability to generate a really cool idea and get feedback on it publicly before you take a lot of risks. So I would probably, if I was at ground zero, really consider one of those routes. Um, but otherwise I think like we have a lot of you know, when we think about four by 400, where we own brands, we have sort of a set of principles that we think about for e-commerce businesses. And, and the idea is really just that it's hard to win. Um, and I want to select a product and business structure that gives me the best chance of winning. It doesn't guarantee it. And so the way I think about that is like 75 plus points of margin, right? Um, the fastest production timeline that I can, the lowest total cost of goods. Um, ideally it's like low cost of production, low cost of shipping, Right. And ideally it has a, at least a 30% increase in LTV within 60 days. Like there's a set of attributes. We, one of the things, if we're going to use Facebook as the primary distribution for ads, I want it to be niche or novel. So niche, meaning I know the community that it exists in and they're going to really relate to it or novel as in something nobody's seen before. It's really hard to sell commodities that are in Facebook that aren't going to stand out in any way. So that's like a set of attributes that I would consider for the product and thinking about starting it. Wow. Thank you. That was incredible. Um, <laughs> one or two more questions that are now completely outside of e-commerce, completely outside yeah. of the agency around kind of some of your passion around sports and, you know, NBA top shot and some of those things. So the first one is which player's baseball card do you think will appreciate the most in the next 10 years? So all of my, I'm trying to think of what I have right here to validate the statement. Uh, so the three baseball players are by are Juan Soto, Fernando Tatis and Ronald Acuna, right? Like that's the simplest answer that those three are, absolute Hall of Fame legends and then Mike Trout. Like I, I'm a big believer in like buy the blue chips and hold them forever. Like that's that's the simplest strategy. Now that said, I have a bunch of like um, 
like I'm, I'm also because I'm such a big baseball nerd. So this is CJ Abrams. He's one of the Padres top prospects. Like I, in baseball, there's this really weird dynamic where player values of their cards usually peak when they debut. So in the NBA or everything else, it's like the stars that hold the value. But in baseball, it's all about prospecting. It's like people betting on the future. So I, I spend a lot of time in that world, and there's like a pretty safe market of like if you're looking for lower end stuff. Where if you go look up like the Baseball America Top 100 and you look in like the 40 to 80 range and you go look up PSA 10 Bowman First Chromes of that subset of people, you can find them in the 40 to 60 dollar range and they'll be at 150 at debut and that's really really safe. So depends on the play you're trying to make, whether it's flip or long term hold. But those would be my two strategies: blue chips for long term hold, top prospects for flip. This is sick. I love this. And the last and final question. Uh, what NBA top shop would you buy for one care under for the best return? See, that's, so that's sort of the problem. So I wouldn't do it for NBA top shop. So NBA top shop, the problem with that market in particular is that, um, it, like there, there's a, there's an incongruence between the supply of some of the like general assets and the current value that is way out of whack. Um, if you think about it, most baseball cards, like if you buy a pack of baseball cards, 99% of them are completely worthless. They're, you know, noisemakers and bike spokes and stuff that's thrown around because they're worthless, like literally zero less than a penny. Um, the same is going to be true for NBA Top Shop. Most of them are going to be worthless. The cards that you want are any collectible, the core assets are scarcity, right? Like, and the quality of the, the nostalgia and the human or the object that it represents. So again, it's, you want scarce LeBron James assets. When it, it, like the only two top shots that I own, uh, my highest value ones are a LeBron James series one and a Zion Williamson rookie debut. Like those are the only two assets that I own. The only other player that I would consider buying is probably Steph Curry and I would buy one of his series ones. They're expensive, but the thing about the NFT space, and this is what I would wait for, is like, it's all gonna be fractional. You'll be able to pay $5 and get into premium assets soon. Even now, like if you go like, so as another example, like in the NFT space, like crypto punks are sort of the OG original asset, right? And, but they're like $57,000 is the cheapest one now. It's super expensive. But if you go to like NFT or NFTX, which is like a site that allows you to create an index with a sub underlying set of assets, you can buy $5 worth of a set of crypto punks and you can get into the best assets. This is, this is why NFTs are so valuable. They empower ownership into high level assets for small dollar amounts. Like this is a really important dis like attribute of them. So I would, I would look for fractional entry into premium assets, not speculate on sub tier assets. Yeah, this is killer. I'm actually learning a lot. I'm, I'm really excited about this. Taylor, thank you so much for the agency, the e-com, the NFTs. Thank you so much for all the wisdom across the board. Um, hey, what's the best way for people to follow up with you, connect with you, work with you, come work for you? Uh, what's the best place to reach you? Come on, I got to chase down uh, Chase on, oh, there's a pun there, on Twitter. Come, let me, let me, this, guy, this guy's blowing past me in his follower account. He's grinding out there. I don't know. Do you have a ghostwriter, bro? Like, how are you, how are you publishing so much content every day? <sighs> it's it's a lot. I'm spending like, out, I'm spending more time than I want to admit. I'm spending like hours and hours a week on it. Like, I've literally part of my job now is to create content for social. Yeah, you're doing, you're doing great. But yeah, at Taylor Holiday on Twitter, that's the best community. And then commonthreadco.com if you want to, if you want to reach out to the business. But awesome. Go give Taylor a follow. Open, come hang. Yeah, give Taylor a follow. Taylor, thank you so much for being here, man. I really appreciate you. All right, buddy. All right, see ya.